Welcome to the MSC booth here at the 2024 AAO. Paul Singh's my name. I'm a, believe it or not, I'm a glaucoma anterior segment cataract refractive surgeon. Uh, and I am going to be talking to you about something that I've been very passionate about. And that truly is just a general topic of vitreous floaters. And I, there's a new terminology I want to talk to you guys about. Instead of using the word floaters now, I really want to help all of us use the terminology clinically significant vitreous opacities, CSVO. Why that's important? Because the connotation of a floater is very different when we talk to each other than what we're really talking about here, which is the significant ones that impact quality of vision, daily functionality. There are patients with these amorphous strings and clouds throughout the vitreous that truly do impact daily function and quality of vision. If you look at data on kind of how many patients actually have it, about seven in 10 people will have a significant floater in their lifetime, and about 30% will be chronic. Our definition of significant is not necessarily the Snellen chart. It's about the patient and the obscuration that it causes. Here's a vitreolysis patient here, showing you kind of, this is the floater, a Weiss ring, and the laser does a great job. What you find is people who have solitary opacities like this, the laser's great. It works well, great outcomes, great efficacy, and safety. But when you have people, unfortunately, who have this, this is something that the laser just can't do. It's too many shots, the laser only vaporizes at such a small portion at any one time, and these amorphous synoretic opacities are different than the fibrotic Weiss ring that we see coming off the optic nerve. These amorphous, this collagen type two, so what's happening in the vitreous? The vitreous is made up of collagen type two with hyaluronic acid that's cross-linked, and there's water that fills the space. So what happens over time, we get a depolymerization. We lose that negative charge of hyaluronic acid around those fibers, and what happens? Those fibers come together, push the water out, you get a lacunae of water with this opacity floating around. Those string-like floaters, which is this stuff, is a lot harder for the laser to break and vaporize than a Weiss ring, which is coming off the optic nerve. So that's why I have found these kind of patients, some type of removal of the floaters versus a laser tends to be a better option. Vitrectomy is great, but here's the problem. For all of us here who are mostly anterior segment surgeons, and even retina surgeons will say, you know what? I'm not gonna do a floater treatment. Is anybody here gonna do a three-port vitrectomy? <laughs> not happening. I know I'm not doing it. I'm not a retina guy. And I don't feel it's safe for me to do a full three-port vitrectomy. I don't have the equipment. So this is where the one step has truly, I can say this very few times in my career, that has truly revolutionized my practice. And I've done a lot of new things in my career, but it really has. I've done 130 of these in about a year and a half now. What, it, and what this is, one step, is basically a 27 gauge needle. That's a tip. It has a port so that you get aspiration or vacuum. And this tip right here, that just behind the tip, this little opening is a dual blade cutter goes bi-directional. So it gives you, depending on your FACO machine, this is attached to your FACO like a vitrector. So if you have a Centurion or a Stellaris, it can be anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000 cusps per minute, depending on your FACO machine. But it's attached to the FACO, and then you have an AC maintainer in the HC, just a 1.0 incision, that keeps the chamber formed. And that's it. No trocars, no viscoelastic, and this allowed me to start to do these procedures in a safe in-office, I do the OBS, office-based surgery suite, with oral volume, five milligrams of volume, and that's it. And these are all real cases. And so here we are, made by 1.0 incision, and I'm putting my AC maintainer in. It's attached to the irrigation of my FACO machine. I get, initially, I bring it up to about 80, get a nice pressurized eye. Measure about three and a half millimeters. This is actually one of my first cases ever. And enter about three and a half millimeters behind the limbus, going th right towards the middle of the eye, and then go right underneath the lens. So towards the middle, and then aim up. So I'm now behind the lens, I'm not touching the capsule, but just behind it, where I can see it. Now, what I'm gonna do is do vacuum, but here's the key for this procedure. Press the pedal, but keep the vacuum under 100 or so. The goal of this procedure is not to pull vitreous away from the base of the retina. We want only whatever's liquefied, whatever's floating around. So if you have a low vacuum, you're gonna naturally only bring pieces that are just floating around. Whatever's attached to the vitreous base, leave it back there. It's a 15 millimeter needle. So it can't go all the way to the posterior pole. You can shove it all the way in. If I go all the way in, go straight back to the posterior pole, you're not gonna hit the posterior pole. And so you see here, look at all these things coming to the tip. I'm just sitting there. Now I might turn it down, turn it up a little bit. So I might change the positioning of the tip, but I'm not moving around all the place. And it's a very visually rewarding procedure. So what's the end point? When do you stop? When you stop seeing things coming to the tip. It's that basic, I know, but that's all we do. Once we feel it's done, come out, take out the AC maintainer, and that's it. 
So these patients do not have to have any suture. There's no cut down of the conjunctiva. There's no trocar. There's no viscoelastic. It's basically an AC maintainer, go in, come out. That's it. And I guarantee any anterior segment surgeon who does cataract surgery should feel comfortable doing this. From a surgical procedure perspective, a very straightforward procedure. Now what's really unique is just the improvement in visual quality and the speed of improvement to baseline is impressive. This is a still image from the scope right before we started and right after we finished. Can you guys see a difference in the quality? Just look through the eye. I mean, you don't have to have any special ray tracing to see the improvement pre and post. We have 72 eyes in this cohort now, we have almost a year follow-up now. 69 average age of patients, pretty more heavily towards female, towards male here. 100% of patients were back to baseline vision or improved vision at one week, 100%. In our multifocal lens set, subset of patients, trifocal patients, who are a lot of them were sent to me as a last step before a lens exchange, these patients had about a one and a half lines of improvement, especially in reading. We always blame the multifocal lens, saying this trifocal lens is causing bad quality of vision for the patient. If you had said me this, yeah, that was an unhappy patient for sure. But was it the lens? Should we have taken the lens out or take out the vitreous? And look what happened. So this is why my, I think the best kind of patient to start with is if you have a patient who's not happy with the multifocal, before you take the lens out or send it for a referral, Think about the vitreous. Think about doing something to help that patient out as well. All right, safety. How do these patients do? I told you about the visual recovery, 100% at one week. True fact, it's great. I did have about five eyes with a transient spike in IOP, all resolved within a month. We had topical medications, topical anti um, IOP medications, all went, uh, went down on its own. All anterior chambers, so no cell at one week. No cell in the vitreous or the AC. It's a very, as you can tell, a very quiet eye. You're not touching any tissues. It's so important if you develop, decide to adopt this technology, the protocol of staying still, low vacuum, are really important because the goal is not to pull the vitreous. And I always recommend, if you have retina colleagues around you, to let them know you're doing this. I think it's important. I mean, it's, it, you, know, you may not like it, and I have a retina colleague in our area who's a great retina specialist. He's very facile. 27 gauge retractors, he's very quick with those. But they're trocars and they have longer recovery. We talk about the risk in doing a full vitrectomy. And so he doesn't like that I'm doing this, but he says I got your back. So he's not happy, I'll be honest with you. But at least I have his buy in a sense of, if I have a question, if I have a co you know, concern after surgery, he's like, I'll see him for you, don't worry, I understand. Because you just want to go to them and say, here's what we're doing, here's why. And so that's my advice. The same thing I did before I did vitreolysis. Talk to the retina folks as well.